Hello and welcome to the fourth webinar of the Phil Prime program. Um, uh, it is a, a pleasure to have with us today Daniel Armanius, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and will be the main presenter on the topic. And also a pleasure to have Ancho Ramalho, the CEO of FASEC, uh, who will be the main discussant during this webinar. I would also like to thank our colleague, uh, João Claro, from the uh, Industrial Engineering Management Department of the School of Engineering of the University of Porto for helping to prepare and to uh, uh, have us in inviting uh, Daniel Armani. So thank you very much. We are now on live on Zoom and also on the um, channel of FILP uh, at YouTube, FILP TV. So I really uh, hope that we will learn from this uh, webinar. And I thank everyone who's attending it uh, and everyone who will see it later on also, uh, because we have many people who then after the event will uh, uh, go to YouTube and or to our web page to listen and to learn from this uh, webinar. So uh, as we say, uh, in uh, Europe with a, a, a Middle European accent. Uh, without further ado, uh, Daniel Armanius, the control of this webinar is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jao and, and Angelo for the, for the invitation. And I'm sharing my screen now to make sure I can, I can see, can everyone see my screen? Yes, very well. Perfect, thank you. So. Once again, thank you. It's such an honor to talk about this, to be invited by the University of Porto School of Engineering and FSEC for this prime talk and, uh, and, and an issue that I, I, I care a lot about. Uh, and what I will do in this talk is kind of highlight three roles that I've seen public research institutes and even the government facilitate to help transfer uh, scientific discovery in academia and, and you know, national research institutes more generally and, and how they work with industry to do that. Um, what I always like to do before I start is just acknowledge I have a wonderful set of collaborators I've got to work on over the years and both funders and, and um, both students and faculty that have been really crucial in this kind of work that I've done. So this is just an acknowledgement of all their efforts and also the funders who have contributed this work. So I want to give kind of a, a high level picture of what the, what the kind of debate is right now and, and where I've seen it. And there's a debate as to the degree that government, even academia, should be involved in markets. The challenge has been it has they haven't really empirically or analytically looked at the different agencies within the government. So on one hand, you have um, earlier work, uh, Josh Lerner, Hernando de Soto, that really emphasized the state as a regulator, right? You know that it only should regulate the market playing field, and it's not equipped to select or you know cultivate promising innovations. It's just not their skill set. On the other hand, if we look at Mariana Mazzucotto, who talks a lot about what's going on in Europe and, and North America, and Justin E. Fulin, who talks more about global South economies like, you know, China and even as uh, in places also like Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria and the like, they argue that the state is more of a cultivator, an incubator, because their argument is, is that if a country wants to realize better growth ambitions, that they're going to have to really cultivate industries around their comparative advantage through high-end science and the like to be able to compete and to fight for those kind of high-value niches that are occupied by other economies. And so they ask, you know, they, they really see it as more of a state-driven development, filling in gaps in science and the like. But the question is, what exactly then the role should, the, the role that the state should play? And this is theoretical work, and there's some kind of large scale macroeconomic studies in this, but if we look at what individual agencies, individual research institutes are doing, it's not clear, right, empirically. And so what I mean by this is that there's a hope with state or with academia that you wanna see some effect on technology entrepreneurship. And those studies have proxied the state in two ways. One is inputs, and this is the same with academia, inputs in terms of human capital and the like, and how it affects entrepreneurship and innovation. And then on the other hand, the policies or the outcomes that encourage it. So 
things like in the U.S. the Buy Dole Act or Technology Transfer Act, and what is their impact on in entrepreneurship and innovation on a on a national research institute or academia? And so, really, the state is kind of this magical black box, or the institutes are these magical black box, and something happens and it has an effect. And so, my work initially was to try to be more clear about exactly what different roles are for different agencies, different research institutes, okay? And so I'll, I've highlighted kind of my work has discovered kind of three roles. We'll discover the first one around intermediaries, those who help connect private sector entrepreneurs to public sector kind of know-how and funding. Scaffolding, which I think will be central probably to our discussions today, which is helping build the knowledge for entrepreneurs to recognize or comprehend market opportunities from science, as well as not just entrepreneurs, but also industry that are interested in this and, lo and local government institutions that are experimenting with the right policies, especially increasingly in industries like drone technology, additive manufacturing, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, where the technology trajectory and even how to properly set up or regulate or govern a market are both unclear, okay? And for this work, I highlight China. I think it's a good example because of the growth it's experienced. And I think it has insights that are still transportable to a lot of contexts. So to give some situation is that if you look at, for example, the number of high-tech manufacturing, and let me put on my laser pointer here. If you can see, you can see China has really boomed, is almost, it's starting to compete almost at parity with the US. And the same thing with science spending. So they've been able to grow quite drastically from a, a much earlier starting point. And so the question that kind of led me to look at these roles is trying to understand this rise. And many have argued kind of the infrastructure point. Uh, sorry, many have argued the incentives point, which is if you get students to patent or collaborate or scientists or other um, doctoral students, et cetera, to patent and collaborate with industry, they will start doing those kind of patents and transferring knowledge. But what I argue and this is where the state is its role is as an infrastructure that, so to give an example, let's say I have policy to encourage green energy and encourage scientists to patent green energy. It's not clear if there's not industry out there who fully comprehend or understand how photovoltaics work, how does green energy work, whether those kinds of things will work. So even if I incentivize as much as possible, scientists and others to disseminate their work, if on the receiving end industry doesn't have a sense of where this can work in their, in their interests, then it may not still happen. And so it's, it's a mix of not just policy incentives, but really careful infrastructure um, from the state, from research institutes, from academia to help facilitate that transfer, particularly in local level, right? So let's kind of highlight this as we go. So this is um, some work on some science parks. And the, the challenge here is trying to understand what do science parks do for an entrepreneur or academia or, or for a, you know, a star scientist who's looking to kind of bring out their work to market. There's kind of two things they do. One is verifying your capabilities. So having ability to say, this person is really strong in what they do. This is someone worth investment and the like. And then the other is actually helping build business know-how, marketing, uh, market analysis, understanding technological specifications and the like. And these two roles are, are crucial. In, in kind of how science parks work, especially in the, how they work in China. So this first study, which is one of my more well-known studies, is I looked at, I used some useful advantages in the urban design of, of Haidian district, which is part of Beijing, to look at comparing out of, of uh, ventures or businesses outside the science park with those inside in very close proximity. They're often on the same street. So I gave surveys to both sides and matched these, um, so if we look at the ventures outside the park and inside, I matched them based on year and industry. So I looked at, you know, let's say a five-year-old firm in biotech outside the park with one inside. And then what we did to handle selection, which this is um, to look at is we then tried to find out things that explain why people are in the park, but don't explain the kind of resources and outcomes. And it turns out a lot of people knew someone or contact that helped them into the park but that context said, look, it's on your own to decide how you achieve your outcomes. And so we've developed, you know, in econometrics, what we call an instrumental variable to handle selection. And this should be inside, uh, this should be related to um, inside the park here, right? And what did we find? So there's two kinds of communities and I'm imagining uh, in a lot of country context is the case. You have returnees who have a lot of managerial and technical know-how 
and you have local well-talented scientists who have a lot of technical know-how, but not as much managerial know-how. And what we found is that the returnees who come back who have both, they really just benefit by being selected by the park. The park is able to verify their talents and say these are high quality, good uh, entrepreneurs or industry personnel to fund. While the local elites were benefiting more from, local elites in this case, educated at the top universities in the country, they benefited not just from being picked, but also all the business model help, the, the market analysis support and the like. And so you see that science parks are remarkably flexible to tailor the skill sets they offer to the needs of industry and entrepreneurs. So then let's go to looking at the bigger picture in terms of um, the more national picture in China and looking at the idea of scaffolds. And essentially you could think of scaffolds, the analogy of a scaffold is think of it like when you're first learning how to ride a bike, it's sometimes easier to start with training wheels or when you're first learning a new language, having some modules that help you kind of build your approach. That's what scaffolds do here. They provide models and early stage development that help you move forward in your understanding or comprehension of the market possibilities of science. And why this was so crucial in China was because the, the public research institute system was not well connected to markets historically. And this was a challenge for the transfer of, knowledge, of technology and science in these markets. And so the Chinese Academy of Sciences had historically weak linkages with the market. And in fact, the first president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences noticed that. He said the main defect with the leadership of the academy is failure to conduct research into the needs of national construction. National construction here in, in the Chinese context is the five-year plans. Um, so really in, in, in investing science into the inputs that would be productive in the marketplace. And for those of you who don't know as background, Chinese Academy of Sciences is the preeminent public research institute system in China. So to address this, they developed a, 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 a program that didn't just incentivize scientists to patent and give them funding for it, but spent a lot of time carefully thinking, what are the institutions I need to facilitate that transfer, especially since the institutes were isolated historically. And so they developed this initiative called the CS Local Cooperation Initiative, and they built numerous science parks to help link the right local kind of players to, to the science. And so what we found here is, and I'll give you some examples later, what we found is once this reform happened, put on our laser pointer again, is that once this reform happened, those states that had a lot of these institutes started booming in terms of their founding rates and innovation. And then interestingly, those who also had science parks were able to catch up. This is that dotted line here that I want you to see. And we can see that uh, visually. So if you look at the founding prior to this reform, it was really on the coast. And that was part of the national strategy of China to start on the coasts. But then when they brought in this institute founding, there's actually a lot more founding inland in, May, in, in more underdeveloped areas. And if you look at the CAS institutes, the ones that have more, you see a pretty reasonable correlation between, for example, in this area, if you see those areas that grew a lot, they're also the places that had a lot more, uh, a lot more founding, that had a lot more institutes, right? So how did this work visually? You had the CAS in isolation, and then you had a tripart arrangement that was really facilitated through science parks. And in fact, only four years and only China can do, four years, they built 60 science parks had agreements with the Ministry of Science and Technology, built another 43 later on, and had a thousand research meetings directly facilitating provincial government committees with scientists to understand the gaps and where they could help provide knowledge. And we see the results along total revenue, five-year citations, the quality of the science, as well as the licensing and transfer of that science, you see drastic increases. So let me give you a couple of kind of examples to help you see that. So the one example is a spinoff. This is a a new fertilizer company that came out of one of the institutes that developed a slow release fertilizer for, pest, uh, for agricultural use. Um, the CES worked with a local venture capital firm to create a, a CS local company. They took equity in it and the revenues went back to the CS. In just six years, this company made about $430 million in revenue, just this company alone, which is pretty sizable for, for fertilizer if you know that industry. Another example was out of uh, Chengdu, the uh, Organic Chemistry Institute, where they recognized their scientists were really good at developing science, but they didn't understand necessarily the market opportunities. So instead of putting that burden on the scientists themselves, they actually spun off a registered business unit. Think of it like a technology transfer office. And they linked that with the CAS. That unit then went around trying to find companies that found interest in their technology, finding the right matches. 
And then the revenues went back to the Chinese Academy of Science Institute. In this case, it was an organic chemistry institute. And we see this in the National Institute of Physics in Beijing and elsewhere. And to show you visually why this matters, if we look at the places inland, this is where the Organic Chemistry Institute was. And this is where the fertilizer come the Shenyang Institute of Applied Ecology. So now let's look into the future of what China is trying to do now in terms of experimentation. And this is where local government institutes have been extremely important. Um, and this is, um, we're gonna look at the drone industry. Now what's interesting about the drone industry is that it counters a lot of prevailing views we have of the way in which economies develop. The prevailing view is that emerging economies usually lag. This uh, develop the global North economies that kind of develop innovation. And then it's the emerging economies that later manufacture and produce at scale. But if we look at the drone industry, most of the leaders are Chinese companies. So of the 12 consumer UAV firms, half of them are China. China only lags with the United States in terms of new drone designs. So what's happening here? So if we look at the infrastructure at city level, so we look at the number of aerospace science schools as well as agricultural science parks, we see again, prior to the re recognition of the drone industry as, a, as a, an industry, so this was the licensing agreements that happened that formally recognized the industry and registered it. It was those cities that had the right industry infrastructure that was able to rapidly increase their founding of drone firms and the like. And what's remarkable about this industry is that if you took the same picture in the United States, it's highly clustered around a few clusters around aerospace, uh, uh, field, military field bases, aviation centers, but here it's remarkably spread out. <clears throat> And so what is happening here? So I, we split between two kinds of infrastructure that are supported by local governments and academia. One is market input infrastructure, the fundamental science that you need to experiment around product components. And if you know the drone industry, there's numerous components. There's gimbals to hold the cameras, there's payloads, there's avionics, auto automatic controls and the like. And places with top aeronautics schools seem to explain the clustering, that we see the little bit of clustering. So if you look at the total founding and where the aerospace universities are, you see that the places where you see some clustering with the exception of Shenzhen are all around aerospace universities, which is kind of something we know that more upstream is more clustering, more downstream, there's more spread. What's interesting about the um, science parks in this case, they really help experiment around product market fits. And so what's unique about the agricultural science parks is they're focused purely on developing agricultural applications from technology. And as you know, drone industry, as you may know, drone industry is really important in this, the spread of agriculture, spreading pesticides, spreading fertilizer and the like. And it's a, the, probably the biggest area of work in, uh, in, in China, at least. And what was interesting is that the science parks actually provided airspace for testing those products. And so a lot of entrepreneurs told us that in order to coordinate drones and the like, they had the airspace to test it with. And that actually helped them find out the right product fit in the right way, the right specifications for the product. So if we look at total founding here and we look at where the agricultural science parks are, they help explain a lot of the spread in the founding. So what I wanna to do to conclude is, I think that the debate we found before, I think is, um, it's kind of a red herring in the following sense. Red herring meaning that I think it's a debate that's unnecessary. I think what's more, net, what's more important to discuss instead of debating government's involvement is to think what is the support any academic or government institution can provide that can support any entrepreneurial activity. So let's not worry about necessarily picking the right technologies. Industry can do that, but government has a role and academia has a role to provide support. And I think this debate about how much or how little is not useful. We need to spend more time as it's exactly what the roles are that they play. So to summarize, state is, is an intermediary. Essentially, it helps connect or provide different paths to access public know-how and resources to private sector entrepreneurs or industry and other academics. And it's flexible to the kind of skills you have. Do you have business capabilities? Do you not? Do you have technical capabilities? Do you not? And what I don't discuss as much in the second one, the scaffolding place, it also helps Entrepreneurs understand entrepreneur and industry co convene to develop technology specifications, industry standards, and testing. The skate is a scaffold. Think of it like you know the bicycle, the training wheels of a bike. They provide kind of comprehensive or cognitive support for change. They help make know-how, scientific know-how, more accessible, more comprehensible to entrepreneurs as well as those that are interested in industry more generally. 
We find this is really important in more underdeveloped clusters. As you saw, the more inland growth in China, these were places that weren't historically as developed. And then finally, increasingly as, a gov as government academia, we need to start thinking about how do, we how do we deal with the fact that increasingly the high growth market opportunities are not just in unclear in terms of how the market is structured, but technologically they're still developing. For example, what is artificial intelligence gonna mean as a market? What is quantum computing gonna mean as a market? Even additive manufacturing, what is that going to mean as a market is not clear, not just institutionally, but technologically. And so governments need to be more comfortable experimenting around the inputs and outputs of these technologies. And we found a couple of forms of infrastructure that do that. And so without further ado, thank you so much. And I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation, right on time. <laughs> so now I uh, would like to thank Angelo Ramalho, and uh, he will start by introducing FASEC and then uh, make, uh, make some questioning and some dialogue. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, first say thanks to Professor Jean Fafon Iguinha and say thanks to, to, to Daniel for such an excellent presentation. Just uh, just sharing my 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 presentation. It's okay. Martin, perfect yes. for you. You can yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, so uh, what the difference uh, between those examples of China and our the reality that uh, that uh, that we know. Um, uh, and I will develop a little bit um, on our case as, um, as a company uh, uh, with three uh, main strategic pillars um, uh, acting, acting in the area of um, in the fields of energy, environment and, uh, and mobility. So uh, this is uh, the storyline of my presentation. I'll pass directly for, for, for my uh, first uh, content. Um, what have we been doing during these years in terms of uh, investment in 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 R and D in R and D programs? And you you can see in this slide uh, that um, every year we invest um, more than ten million euros. Uh, Thirty five percent of of it are, is external funding, and uh, we try to increase our technology intensity. Uh, even in these um, last uh, two years, 20, 2019 and 2020, that were struggling years for, for us. But as you can see there, at, uh, uh, this year a recovery, a recovery, uh, a recovery year, and we are pushing for. Um, we have um, 38 ongoing uh, um, R&D initiatives uh, with external incentive. Uh, um, saying saying better, 20, 26 ongoing, and the others are in evaluation or in uh, or in. Uh, in preparation, um, uh, and I can say that for a company from our size, uh, our size, it's um, it's we are almost in the limit uh, that we are able to to to, to do. Of course, um, as manager as, uh, and and as leader, we try to increase uh, and to and to and to put more 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 means and more investment on this on this area. And we have to do it because we are in the very competitive marketing and competing competing in 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 areas that they are that they are uh, that are the first enablers for this uh, new economy for for the decarbonization of uh, of the economy. So uh, uh, the, the 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 room for improvement is uh, is is uh, is very big. Uh, so let's it's it's uh, it's up to us to 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 address this, uh, to address it conveniently. Uh, of course, we can't do it alone. Uh, the relation uh, with uh, uh, our our partners, namely uh, uh, all the um, um, academia and uh, and um, uh, scientific stakeholders, is it's very important. And we have uh, a long knowledge of uh, uh, close relationship uh, uh, between uh, between universities and other 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 knowledge centers and uh, and and FASEC. In this in in this slide, in the right side. Talking about uh, strategy in terms of uh, our technology roadmap and the plan for for its uh, uh, implementation, and in the and the, in the left side the tools that support that support uh, the implementation of uh, of those uh, 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 those those roadmaps. Uh, and uh, I stress in that that one 
Opin, uh, that is uh, that is uh, a platform for open innovation that we will have uh, open to the public um, um, after March. In terms of uh, now, in terms of strategy de uh, definition, uh, uh, first of all, to look at markets um, and at the same level to look to look at uh, to, to our clients, uh, actual clients or, or, or future clients, uh, understand uh, what are their tendencies, understand what are their needs. Uh, of course, you are not alone. Uh, competitors are there, uh, and some of them, uh, most of them, they are they are very big, very big players compared with. Uh, with our company um, um, uh, in very competitive markets and then very capital intensive, uh, intensive uh, development. Um, then uh, to, to make an internal uh, analysis, what we are, what are we able to, 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 to develop uh, in terms of our internal skills, but not only internal, in terms of, of, of developing partnerships uh, uh, to, that, uh, that uh, uh, allow us uh, to uh, to achieve our 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 goals and talking about uh, new business areas, uh, uh, how can we um, uh, create synergies, uh, um, uh, creating clusters of of, of competencies, uh, internal and external, in order to anticipate as far as we can uh, time 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 to market. Well, as I was saying, uh, our main pillars in uh, energy, mobility, and environment. But cities are the are the uh, and greener cities are the are the destination of these of these technologies. Uh, uh, um, uh, not in uh, not only in terms of, of uh, electric mobility that probably is the is most visible uh, area of uh, actuation in the in most recent times. But uh, talking about infrastructure, infrastructures uh, in every area, uh, in energy, in environment, uh, in transportation, heavy transportation, light rail, whatever, and have uh, an holistic vision and capacity for integration uh, of these uh, of uh, of these all um, uh, infrastructures in 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 terms of uh, experienced user uh, or things like that. Um, uh, and you can see uh, I. I do not detail our competencies uh, in each of these quarters uh, of this of these uh, slides. Um, uh, we started to be and we still are a TND company, trans transmission and, and distribution company. Uh, our our probably uh, our our main business um, in the uh, today uh, and in the next few and in in the next time it will it will be a power transformer, power and distribution transformers. But new business that are developing de developing around uh, automation competencies are moving are moving are moving fast. And how do you use uh, our skills uh, in terms of uh, projects that we are development and um, and uh, and these uh, colorful um, uh, graphics uh, are just this this uh, this um, this match uh, between between our R and D skills. And projects that are uh, being developed, and from these projects, we will have new products or new features on all the project, uh, all the products, uh, and new projects or or new or new or new services. Uh, and uh, uh, it's quite it's quite uh, colorful, and that it's it's a, a good a good uh, example of uh, diversity in terms uh, in terms of competencies that uh, that that are needed. And more, and on top of it, our uh, capacity to integrate all those capacities, and on top of it, to do it in an efficient, uh, in an efficient way, and addressing properly time to market. And this is the way. Uh, and this is the way uh, from the start, uh, looking to the market, as I was saying before, uh, to the client perspective. Um, uh, 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 planning uh, uh, and new players of uh, the energy uh, and energy systems detection of specific and, and future challenges challenges for 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 clients uh, uh, design the design the the the, the solution uh, and uh, having a, a pilot move to certificate it and and finally to to launch to launch uh, a new product or 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 service. Uh, once again, market view, uh, client view, um, uh, partnership, very important. Uh, it's central partnership, co-development, um, 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 uh, risk mitigation, whatever, uh, risk sharing, uh, whatever you, 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 you intend. And finally, uh, a new product or service 
that is, uh, that is um, um, able to do its role in the market. And um, a, a few figures, uh, a, few, a few figures uh, for us to better understand um, uh, this way uh, uh, that has um, more than 30 years uh, and that will continue, um, uh, even if FASEC passing uh, passed through uh, very challenging times. We are building up, rebuilding for a new future uh, and things are going uh, right on path. Uh, but, but, but let me stress on this. Um, uh, on this last four year, more than uh, 130 M M masters, uh, industrial masters uh, are focusing on ours uh, in all our activities. More than 30 uh, PhDs, uh, more than 40, 40 projects, uh, uh, R&D projects uh, that have been uh, de de developed and in close relation uh, with universities and, and, and research centers. Uh, every semester um, uh, on primacy classes supported by, uh, by our, uh, our own experiences. And this is very important to, to, to create uh, proximity and to, and to create better fit between, uh, between uh, what you, we can have from universities and our expectation and our needs uh, of, uh, of, of competencies. Um, more than 10 in, in, in intellectual property uh, uh, generated jointly uh, with authors from academia uh, uh, and and FASEC. Very very important to share to share these uh, these these goals. It's it's very it's very important and to celebrate them. It's very important and to share that celebration. It's very it's very important. And I, I, I as I was say, uh, saying. More than 30 years in this path. Uh, once again, every semester, uh, some 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 curricular in internship integrated on our R&D projects. Uh, um, uh, we have two collaboratives. Uh, one of one of it very very near uh, very near uh, uh, Philp uh, and very important for us. Um, um, uh, continuously training courses, master classes, and focus groups uh, for ideas change and knowledge knowledge deepening and knowledge knowledge uh, knowledge uh, sharing very important um, and publications um, more than 200 publications from 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 um, uh, 2018 um, and uh, and uh, and that's it um, um, this uh, collaboration between academy uh, uh, and FASEC uh, uh, is is long uh, it's very important for our for for, for our strategy um, 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 and uh, it shows uh, uh, very, very positive uh, results. Uh, very positive results. I, I can, I can say without any doubt that uh, uh, FASEC uh, uh, um, it's very uh, uh, supported, very well supported in relation to to the academia. And um, um, if uh, we uh, are not moving faster. Uh, uh, probably uh, that's our issue. Uh, it's 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 from our side to solve the to solve this uh, um, uh, inability. But anyhow, um, uh, I don't. I have no doubts that, namely, between uh, um, uh, University of Port and uh, and uh, and FASEC and this close relationship, uh, it it will continue and will and and will continue to be very 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 fruitful. And uh, that's all uh, what I have for you uh, right now. Um, please um, uh, make your questions as well. Uh, uh, um. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, now to open the discussion between the two guests. So if Angel wants to make some question to, uh, to Daniel or if Daniel wants yes, to make some uh, questions. I can start because I I I I, I was delighted uh, uh, listening uh, from Daniel about that uh, Chinese model. Uh, uh, that as, as far as I understood, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not uh, so close to our to our experiences. Uh, so uh, I would uh, Daniel, uh, in your opinion and uh, uh, in relation to Europe, uh, how can you compare? Uh, and um, and please those uh, make that comparisons uh, to the best references you can have in uh, European state members uh, mm -hmm. um, that you e e eventually can can detach uh, mm -hmm. because I believe that uh, moving as fast as China is doing uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a uh, it's a very very uh, big challenge uh, mm -hmm. and I don't know uh, if our model 
is strong enough to to allow us to 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 speed it uh, um, as 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 those Chinese do. Mm. Yeah. So I, I thank you so much, Angela, for the question. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was it was fascinating to see what you what you all are doing. Um, I think the way I think of it is I don't I think the concepts potentially transfer, but not necessarily the measures. So what I mean by this is. I think the idea of having supportive infrastructure along a market value chain, um, supportive infrastructure that facilitates connections between scientific know-how and, and markets are, are necessary. Now, how that's going to be measured or done is going to be definitely different for each uh, area. So I can give you some, and, and, and also I saw elements actually of what you're doing at Epicec that's that, that does have resonance, despite it's, I think the, 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 um, the, where you want to take it and what markets is obviously different. But I think the idea of a supportive infrastructure to build it, especially along the different value chains you're doing is, is, is really fascinating. Um, to give a couple of examples, I think um, one in Portugal and one actually, I think that the EU European Commission is trying to do. What I've noticed is the European Commission right now has a program where they're trying to understand, I forgot the name of the program, but they're looking at they're trying to understand each different kind of city or member state's trajectory of growth. And they're trying to unpack the different infrastructure that's supporting, that supports that growth. And so their view is that you need kind of a localized kind of tailored approach to each city, to each member state. But the idea that you still need infrastructure and collaboration between academia, industry and the like um, is still there. And then to give even a more detailed example that may be interesting um, in Portugal, um, Jaime Bonenroca, I believe, is at Eindhoven University. He has some really nice work recently looking at how the polymer additive, manuf uh, polymer additive manufacturing developed differently than metal and additive manufacturing in uh, Portugal. And they basically shows how different cities had different forms of that infrastructure. And when institutional changes occurred that Kind of led way to one or the other they had different kind of growth trajectories and it was actually a, a very nice piece i'm happy to to dig it and, and find it to, to send but it was it, it was the same kind of idea that i think there's the, the debates around this and the notion of what industry should do is somehow kind of they need to pick the right technologies right away as if they have that foresight they need to just kind of let it kind of operate on its own i think there's increasingly models such as yours in China and elsewhere that are basically trying to be much more mindful of what's the supporting institutional organizational environment, one, and then how do I tailor it to the local comparative advantages of a city, of a member state? And so I think in general, the concept of infrastructure supporting different parts of the industry, infrastructure to support the transfer to make it more comprehensible, I think that transport but what that's going to look like for FSF, for Portugal more generally, for these different states will be different. Um, but that's kind of where I see it. I think there's increasingly recognition of the need to connect these policies with other supportive mechanisms locally to help support this activity more, more closely to where it's happening, as opposed to um, kind of at a higher level in terms of national systems. Okay, thank you. I think uh, I'll open the questions to the audience and I'll uh, ask uh, if someone wants to make a question. I have some that I received, but uh, I think the, 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 the audience also wants to raise some questions, but I would like to, to raise your hand in the reactions uh, panel uh, if you want to raise a question. I have a uh, uh, I have a request for a, for a question from uh, Jaime Xado. Uh, I hope you're listening. So if you want to, to enter the discussion, please connect your microphone and ask the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, João, for the invitation to participate in this seminar. I am an economist, but it's always a pleasure to participate <laughs> in a more engineering discussion. I want to congratulate my friend, Angela my for the excellent presentation he made about the uh, FASEC. But I'd like to make a question to Danielle. It's a more conceptual <laughs> question. As you know, one of the concepts that now is becoming more important is the concept of ecosystem. Uh, and Europe is going to launch in one month the new European industrial strategy that is focused on a new concept of ecosystems. That is to say, 
how in an ecosystem it is possible by open innovation and collective intelligence uh, from your uh, perspective to develop a new kind of uh, cooperation between university and companies. And what mm -hmm. do you think it will be the role of the usual uh, intermediaries like the clusters, the science parts and others in this kind of new ecosystem uh, agenda? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, the way I've seen the ecosystem literature um, evolve will help kind of situate where I think the this literature this is the ideas are going. I think they're very early, even as early as the 1900s earlier with Marshall and others. The the argument was first just to justify clustering happens, and I think we we kind of know that now that's that's the case. The next step has been kind of seeing why do clusters start happen in certain places versus not, and I think what's new now and what's related to what we're talking about here is trying to now think going inside the ecosystem and trying to understand what are the different organizational roles in that ecosystem. So not just that we have an ecosystem in a city, but what do, what do science parks do in that city? What do government agencies do in the like? And I think what that means is going forward is, is a couple of things. One, I think um, increasingly because there's these public private collaborations that are more tighter to kind of transfer knowledge and ecosystem, I think, one thing that's going to be interesting to look at is the varieties of ways in which that kind of kind of hybridization between public and private sector manifests in different countries. So, for example, in China, one of the reasons this could work is that the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the institutes can take equity directly in companies, right? They get, a, for, for example, one of their most famous ones is Lenovo that came out of a Chinese Academy of Science Institute and they have equity. And that's actually quite a bit of the revenue of, of, the, of the system. As opposed to now, if you look at, just because I know this more familiarly, uh, in the United States, that would be equivalent to the National Science Foundation taking money in a company. And that's just not possible in our system. So I think there's some underlying discussion that needs to happen as to terms of what kinds of avenues, what kind of experimentation will be to allow kind of this kind of hybridization between public sector and private sector. I think that's gonna be really crucial because it's gonna decide how you can allocate benefits. How, how can, is it, is it gonna be some special zones that you can do this stuff? Is it gonna be different? It's not um, clear. I think the, um, uh, the, the second thing too is a recognition that is, a, is another set of literature that is also challenging this is that even with entrepreneurial ecosystems, the underlying assumption with ecosystems is still that we somehow have a sense of where the comparative advantages of our location and how to cultivate that. So, you know, and even in the, even in the work of Mariana Mazzucotto, others, the idea is that the government knows they're really good in, I don't know, some kind of manufacturing, and then they can cultivate industries towards that. But now when we're getting into these, what I call experimental markets, like drones, like additive manufacturing, like quantum, it's not clear where the technology is going. And so as a result, it's also not necessarily clear what kind of supportive manufacturing and market institutions I need. And so how to think about how ecosystems experiment to recognize what those advantages are or not and how that varies, I think is going to be a path forward. And so those are kind of the two things I think are going to be are going to be consequential for how we think about ecosystems, looking inside and then new governance mechanisms to allow this kind of joining between sectors. Some countries allow it more readily than others, and, and we have to see on that. And then also, how do you handle high growth markets where it's not immediately clear how that tailors to the advantages I have in my kind of particular ecosystem. And going forward, I'm, I'm be excited to see how that progresses. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll raise a question then that was uh, uh, sent to me before the webinar by Juan Cortez, another Juan, and uh, is the CEO of Cello Plash. And is is asking me, uh, Madame, must tell you, Daniel, uh, and it is, this is for both Daniel and uh, Angel. Uh, we have some interface institutions at the university, which are more uh, they are autonomous, but they are more concerned with the uh, development or applied research and uh, services for the. Uh, industry or for outside companies and outside organizations. But uh, the question is uh, this relationship with these institutions is more 
by the most advanced and innovative companies. And for, for Angelis, do you agree with this? And also for uh, um, how can those smaller and less innovative research, uh, less innovative businesses um, can uh, benefit or what should they do to benefit from this, uh, I would say, infrastructure that already exists, but of course it must be improved. Yes, uh, Sean, thanks for the question. Um, uh, very pertinent question. Um, um, uh, you know, those uh, interface centers, um, those, those ins institutes you are refer referring uh, uh, are, are very important in relation between uh, between uh, academia and uh, and universe and um, and uh, and uh, industry uh, and uh, namely uh, here in uh, uh, in uh, Oporto University uh, we have very very good examples uh, I would attach um, in Esk and in Edgy and uh, uh, we are uh, primary beneficiaries uh, beneficiaries of um, um, the existence of those uh, interface centers, of their, uh, their, their skills, their capabilities. And um, a big, uh, big part of our, of our developments are, are co-developments, namely with uh, INESC and more recently with, uh, with INESC. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I used to say, and I said it uh, more than once publicly, uh, that that uh, if uh, if we don't do more, um, the fault is 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 our side. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's from our side companies that must have the initiative to to challenge those those uh, interface centers uh, and and push for them to 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 answer. Um, uh, my experience is that every time we did it, uh, we were successful. Both parties, we were successful. But uh, of course, uh, um, it's easier for us to do the role of, of, of challengers because, uh, um, with my eyes, it's easier to say that we are we are closer to the market, we are closer to the to the to the to the market trends, so we can transfer that vision into those into those interface centers and challenge them to 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 to, to tackle with us, partnering with us, uh, finding find, finding proper answers to those to those challenges. Uh, it, it, once again, we have um, a long way to 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 to, to share and to develop. Uh, and what we did until now, um, um, I, I think I think I'm sure. Uh, that is uh, positive enough, more than that, uh, to motivate us to go to go to go further. Uh, uh, I'm focusing o o on uh, Oporto University, but I, I could I could I could talk about uh, say uh, I could talk about uh, other institutions in the center or, or in the south region of the country that um, do uh, uh, that do with us uh, uh, partner with us, uh, not with with that that intensity because proximity physical proximity uh, it uh, it helps uh, but anyhow uh, uh, again uh, very good examples of uh, of co uh, co development uh, let's say but let's push for it thank you daniel i don't know if you want to say something sure i think um thank you for the question and it's an important one and i think um and I, I want to kind of convey some things that I learned from Angelo's presentation that can help a little bit with this. I think the fundamental underlying issue is, is that there's kind of two things in why R&D investment helps a company. It's not just about developing their own products, but it also builds their ability to understand trends outside the company, right? So yes. what we call Good. what some call absorptive capacity. And so the, the, the challenge, I think, fundamentally to the question is, how do I build to start the process of building my absorptive capacity when I didn't historically have it, right? And I think, I think there's a, a few things, um, some from Angela's presentation, but others. But I did find also in my work that, you know, thinking of co-patenting as a form of learning and form of comprehending the market trends, working with academia, others try to test some things out, see what gets panned and not, and that provides a data point to at least jumpstart your ability not just to do your own products but to build your capacity to understand externally. But then this is also, I'm, I'm really heartened by this question because it's also the reason we focus so much on scaffolding. So our argument was, if we're dealing with 
uh, uh, other companies that are not familiar with this process may not have the resources to kind of build that directly. Then our thought was, if you can build scaffolding on the academic end or on the government end to help make that kind of understanding clearer, then you can potentially help the gap to at least help some of these companies begin that process of building absorptive capacity. And then eventually what you would do, and I think what Angela has done, which I really is quite fascinating, is then you could build a portfolio approach to do this across a variety of industries as you start building your learning and see where things apply. And so I think the, the, to, to the answer to the question, I think when you're trying to first build that initial kind of scientific know-how and be able to comprehend market trends or what our researchers call absorptive capacity, there's some kind of interesting ways to start learning through co-patenting, or this is where the academic end with their licensing office or building models that show how you can take our scientific know-how and translate it into certain market um, opportunities can help bridge that gap of comprehension. And then eventually you can start replicating that across a variety of other industries to have kind of more of a portfolio approach of where this applies. And so I think, I think fundamentally the question, which is, is a good one is how does, you know, we can ask what can industry do, but we can also think about how can academia or research institutes also bridge that gap on their end. And somehow we'll meet in the middle in, in a different way, but that's, and this is what these interface institutions are trying to do. How do I take this academic and make it more comprehensible to market and vice versa? How do I take this market opportunities and, and help academics and others recognize that there's some potential benefits of their science in that space? And it's a constant negotiation and, and you know, the pendulum swings more towards the industry side or more towards the um, academic side, depending on the starting capabilities of those involved, right, in my opinion. Thank you very much. We have another question from uh, Jean Claro. I hope you are ready and uh, you may connect your yes. microphone. Okay, yep. go ahead. Yes, thank good you. afternoon. Thank you. And thank you again. Special greeting to Daniel. Thank you very much. This was an awesome presentation. Uh, so I had a, a couple of questions. One was, is, um, uh, have you found, so in addition to these three uh, important infrastructure roles that you have identified, have you identified other roles where it, the infrastructure has not been successful? So these are uh, elements of infrastructure where you have found uh, an impact and success. Are there any areas that you have found or that, that you suspect that the, uh, this, this uh, positive role is not uh, quite so successfully uh, fulfilled? So that's one question. The other is I was wondering if uh, mirroring the sequence of your research, so you started with the uh, intermediary, then scaffold, then experimenter. If there's also some kind of precedence uh, or sequence in these different roles that you can have in the infrastructure. So before you move to uh, uh, building an infrastructure to support scaffolding, uh, do you need to do something before that? So is there are there any preconditions in the sequence to to the roles that, that you can uh, develop in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those, those quite important questions. Um, so what I found in my work, especially situating it within the larger literature was, you know, what was so surprising actually about this, particularly the science park finding is if you look at the literature in general of where science parks are situated, be it the US, um, uh, European Union states, et cetera, is that the, the, the fascination was is that in other parts of the, of the world, the effects of science parks are extremely mixed. And in fact, some of them are, 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 the verdict is not very clear if it even is successful at all. And what it boils down to, in my opinion, is that what makes, it, it's, a, it's really crucial why these are intermediaries. Is it really crucial about what you have around the, 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 the organization to play with? If you're hoping for a science park to just come in a vacuum and just set, set together and develop adventures, it usually doesn't work because science parks are intermediary. So they have to have something to intermediate. They need to have talented people there. They need to have industry people there to actually coordinate. If there's no ingredients to make the recipe, the recipe is not useful, right? And, that's just, and this is the mistake some governments have made are hoping in, in, in underdeveloped areas, I'll just throw a science park and it will work. What's interesting with the Chinese case is that they had a lot of these kind of ingredients together, but because they were transitioning their system from centrally planned to more market oriented, they needed this ability to coordinate. So they had the ingredients there. They just needed someone to help construct recipes. So that's where I think it fails. If you try to put some of this infrastructure in isolation, 
it, it needs to have some tools. And then to your, to your second question, I think relates to that is if you want to build scaffolding and elsewise, you need to have strong human capital and fundamental upstream know-how to do that. And that's why what I really liked to tie to what Angelo was doing, I think on slide eight, what was really quite, quite mindful, and I haven't seen in many industries, is that you know most of them focus on the product bottom version of the slide. They don't think of all the infrastructure you need before in terms of cultivating academic partners, the capital you need, the, to the PhD students, the, 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 even the certification mechanisms, and so on. All of that to me is infrastructure that not all firms do and would have to be done elsewise. And so until you have all of that stuff, like the human capital, the kind of, um, you know, local trade association, other that can clarify things, it's hard to build scaffolding if there's nothing to scaffold, right? And so this is kind of, so to, the long story short to your question is essentially these infrastructure need ingredients, need human capital, need other firms and so forth. If you're hoping that this will operate in isolation, it's usually quite difficult. And so infrastructure is only one part, but it needs other ingredients and resources to then make it necessary to coordinate. And so, you know, you know in short, it's not, it's, it's difficult to coordinate if you have nothing to coordinate, right? No ingredients across. And so that's kind of where I see the failures have happened in, in terms of situating in the greater literature. But, you know, final point, there is some interesting potential counter cases. If we look at mobile payments in sub-Saharan Africa, which developed in PACE and others, it seemed that came out of areas that were going not just through, kind of not just didn't have this or those, those, those elements there, but even they were being massively disrupted often by political turmoil. And so this is something I'm trying to understand to what degree are these systems resilient to instability, right? And, and, and so there are some counter examples, but at least in my view, that's what I've seen more generally. Well, thank you very much. We've run out of time and uh, it's been a very interesting uh, webinar. Thank you for uh, excellent presentations and thank you for uh, the very interesting questions and answers. Uh, I've learned and uh, uh, that's the most important, I think, and then that we can then act on what we learn and uh, help some others to, to be better. So. Uh, if someone has a question that has not uh, made, uh, made uh, that not, not was not able to ask, please send it to me, and I will forward it. So I will learn also from those interactions. So thank you again, Angelo. Thank you, Jean Claro, and yes, well. thank you, Daniel. And hope to thank see you, you so much in well. our fifth webinar in about one month. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.